Thank you, Dr. Salago. Uh, let's thank uh, Dr. for everyone. It's a privilege to speak uh, before you. Uh, my, my group in animal science. Uh, I was timing to switch the uh, problem. Uh, but definitely, my talk will be maybe 10, 10 times longer. Uh, okay, this will be my chance. So, I hope uh, okay, uh, this, uh, I'm going to be able the Lampinigi Sakin and Circa is under five o'clock on Monday. So, so, uh, look for your aid and talk maybe in the rest of the past. So, but it's a lot of your father from the book. So, yeah, now, we're going to say a major habit. The outline I have prepared, or the outline for the uh, lecture I have prepared for this afternoon is divided into four parts, starting with the introduction. Uh, highlighting some definitions and some statistics of what's happening in on the organic agriculture in general and the uh, organic livestock agriculture in particular. The second uh, set will be about uh, the regulations and standards that are being considered in five major areas for issues involving organic livestock farming. And I'll be also flashing some uh, list of uh, R&D topics that might be present in the future. And then uh, the third part, which is my part, is that about organic livestock breeding strategies for smallholder farms. As in uh, organic livestock breeding, acronym is OLB, which is my app, my uh, initials. And uh, the fourth one, the, the last part will be uh, trying to trace the, uh, the contributions of organic livestock farming in attaining food security, particularly for smallholder farmers. So towards the end, I'll be putting up some recommendations as to answer some of the constraints faced by smallholder organic livestock producers. Let me start with the first one. Uh, starting with the origins of organic farming and uh, some definition of terms. Uh, I'd like to show you this uh, timeline wherein uh, organic ag agriculture can be traced to uh, the works of uh, Rudolf Steiner when he first presented a uh, course in Europe sometime in 1924 and the term that was used was biodynamic farming. Although the modern uh, organic agriculture actually came into being in the 1930s and 1940s, and you could check the literature, some of the famous names uh, such as uh, David E. Balfour and uh, Albert Howard from uh, Britain. In fact, in the literature, uh, Sir Albert Howard is considered to be the father of modern organic agriculture. And uh, besides those uh, guys from Britain, we also have uh, names like Hans Muller from uh, Switzerland, G.I. G.I. Rodel from, from the U.S. and of course uh, Masanobu uh, Fukuoka, who is very famous for this, uh, from Japan, who uh, coined the terms like natural farming, another term will be do nothing farming, ecological farming, or simply the Fukuoka method. Um, there have been so many, there have been so many uh, terms that came out, and these are mainly related to the ecological management of the natural sources and most of which are also related to uh, organic farming. That's why, again, if you check the literature, you might have encountered uh, biointensive farming, which was first uh, postulated by Alan Chapman from the US. And then in the 1940s, there was this uh, no field farming, zero tillage, direct planting, or pasture cropping uh, by Edward uh, Faulkner from the US. And in the 1960s, uh, you've got, you, you might encounter the word holistic management made by uh, Alan Sigley from Zimbabwe. In the 1970s, uh, permaculture by the uh, duo of Bill Mollison and David Holgren from, from Australia. The uh, first organic production standards, however, started only in the 1960s. 1960s, and most of these are actually outside, outside the Philippines. And following the timeline, it was only 1974 when the International Federation of Organic Agriculture Movements, or IFOAM, the famous IFOAM, was actually established. And uh, the uh, private international standards for organic production was established by IFOAM in 1980. There have also been organic farming regulations which, were, uh, which have originated in Austria, France, Denmark, and Spain. And this occurred mainly in the 1980s. And then this was followed up by uh, the European regulations, called the EECs, but only in 1991-1991. And of course, you are familiar also with Codex Elementarius, the joint program of the FAO and the World Herd, World 
Health Organization or WHO, and but that came a little bit later, 1999. And in between, just for 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 notation, uh, that one from the U.S. the Organic Food Production Act came in 1990, leading to this uh, U.S. Department of Agriculture National Organic Program. And uh, not to be outdone, the Australians also have their own Organic Federation of Australia, and this was formed only uh, 1998. Now, for the Philippines, one of the things I would like to highlight here would be the role of Masipa. Masipa, which is a um, an NGO, a magsasaka, at siyantipiko para sa pag-unlad ng agricultura, which was established in 1986. And then, uh, in 1995, there was this uh, Organic Producers and Traders Association, or OTA. And then, 2001, we got this Organic Certification Center of the Philippines, 2001. And this was followed by the uh, Philippine National Standards, which was uh, first published, with specifics of which was published in 2003. And then a year later, the Masipa came up with their own farmers' guarantee system. And then uh, you might have heard about NISERT, or NISERT, which is the Negros Island Certification Services. It just came out in 2007. And of course, the most, or the latest, and the most important, would be the uh, passing of this agriculture, Organic Agriculture Act of Philippines, RA 10068, in 2010. So, that in actual will be uh, GPV will be the milestones involved in organic, uh, organic farming. You are familiar also with the uh, definitions of uh, organic agriculture in general, that is a production system that sustains the health of soils and ecosystems and people. Although I'd like to highlight that this will combine, organic agriculture combines tradition, innovation, and science to benefit the shared environment and promote fair relationships and a good quality of life for all people. And there have been so many definitions, like that of IFOAM, the Codex Elementarius, the USDA, NOPs, and then the common uh, definition is that it would organic agriculture would imply application of agronomic, biological, and mechanical methods of production based on, instead of using synthetic chemical outputs. And most of these definitions would actually incorporate the use of several, several techniques which are not exclusive to organic agriculture. And they may be applied, they may be applied in conventional and even in low input production systems as well. As opposed to crops, as opposed to crops uh, animals are integrated in organic farming mainly because animals are not just integrated parts of the whole system, but they are considered as sentient creatures. Sentient creatures meaning to say they are conscious, they are living, and they are responsive. That's the main difference between uh, organic uh, crop production and organic livestock production. Where in this aspect of dealing with the sentient beings, gives the animals a special status on the farm. That is, animals are therefore serve special moral moral consideration. They are individuals that need to be protected and provided to cover their, their needs, their basic needs. And unlike plants, you know, they can suffer, they can interact with each other, and also with humans around them. And animals, therefore, would demand greater and more constant care and attention as opposed to their crops. One uh, further definition would actually compare the terms like organic farming as opposed to traditional and then intensive or conventional farming. And I, I got this from Dr. Dibonucci from uh, 2005. That is, uh, when we say organic farming, it involves an internationally certifiable farm management system with the built-in controls and traceability, hence with some uh, certifications. As opposed to traditional farming, which often connotes subsistence-oriented, no? subsist -oriented, using few or no purchase inputs. And then as for comparison, you're familiar with what's being taught in class, no? uh, intensive or conventional farming, which would utilize uh, those green revolution methods designed to maximize profit, often by extracting maximum output, Using external purchase inputs. Let, let me highlight what the uh, what intensive and conventional livestock product production is, no? so as to highlight in reference to what organic is all about. So when you say intensive or conventional, it's basically designed to increase farm profit. And this is what we were taught uh, when we were uh, a freshman, uh, especially in agriculture. And this would usually involve increasing capital, land, or labor efficiency especially for livestock production. And the aims are mainly to reduce labor per animal, increase the number of animals per land unit, maximize output per food unit. However, 
the way they do intensive light subduction, it would usually imply no direct valuation of the quality of life of the animals. But they could seek and maintain health and well-being, but only so far as it is directly related to performance. The hence, you end up with problems. Problems, and uh, the common problems that have been documented in the following, that is with intensive uh, production, the productive lifetime, as well as fitness and production rates, especially for the higher degrees, are often reduced. The housing, feeding, and living methods usually lead to a specific health and fertility problems. There's a lot. There's a lot. And these resulting disease problems are either tolerated or resolved through the use of the, through the routine use, routine use of chemical drugs, resulting in problems of residues and resistance. And the detachment of livestock production from the soil also creates uh, pollution problems. And this due to the open nutrient cycling as well as the offsite degradation on regions, especially where feed and fodder are actually produced. And then other problems would have would lead to like high risk reliance on feedstocks that are produced from elsewhere. Problems of disposing a livestock waste, especially when done in a harmful quantities and concentrations, which would create imbalances on energy and nutrient level. Now, for the livestock production system and traffic, yeah, for your information, uh, this could actually be classified to agroecological zones. So let me qualify my title that about traffic and that about livestock production, uh, particularly for, for smallholders. When I refer to smallholder farmers, they know that these are known to dominate the rural sector of agriculture in many developing countries found in the tropics, the Philippines included. And if you check the literature, some synonyms that are being used to, to define smallholders would be as follows. So they are often referred to as small-scale farmers, subsistence farmers, marginalized farmers, resource poor farmers, any farmer with low income, low external input, and low tech. Tech, low technology. And there have been so many uh, surveys that were done, and the common characteristics of a smallholder farmer will be as follows that is, if they usually are known to have relatively low levels of formal education and training, they tend not to purchase production inputs. This I took from a uh, paper made for uh, livestock, livestock farmers. Uh, and they have limited access to input and out of markets and to services and credit. I suppose that would be the same also with, with the crop, with the crop farmers. And uh, just to uh, highlight what I mean by uh, tropics, tropics, I usually discuss that lot more relaxed with developing countries. The, uh, the uh, classification according to the agro ecological zones has been uh, used you know, uh, many times in the past, and is based on the precipitation and uh, the number of uh, humid months that uh, a particular location would uh, would, uh, would have. And uh, I would like to highlight that those in blue are actually uh, the same areas where you could find here in the Philippines and in other neighboring countries in Southeast Asia. Okay, so these are the uh, type of uh, production systems that you could uh, find in our in our region. In fact, for Southeast Asia, this table shows you that uh, for all of those land use for livestock production, that one from Southeast Asia represents only less than 6% of what is actually being used for the whole world, 80,000. Especially for those for grassland, na madami na nagsasabi na madami tayong problema sa hayop, mas madami tayong hayop, madami tayong, madami tayong mga baka, pero wala naman tayong aking grasslands. Okay, ang grasslands natin is less than 1% of actually of 23 million uh, kilomet uh, square kilometers. This grassland you could see mainly in South America, particularly in Argentina, and East Asia, including that of uh, Australia. So just to show you where we could put these organic farming systems. In the Philippines, I'd like also to highlight, which is very similar also to other countries in, in the region, the industry is dominated mainly by backyard or uh, smallholder farmers, especially for ruminants. They include buffaloes, goats, and uh, cattle, wherein their, uh, their domination will be uh, in the 90s, low 90s, up to the high 90s in the case of uh, buffaloes. For other farm species, uh, smallholders also uh, occupy a dominant uh, ownership, say for pigs, about two thirds of what pigs in the country are raised by smallholders. Chickens, slightly less than 50%, uh, ducks, 70%. And these are according to the latest uh, statistics from, from the BAS. 
Let me talk now about principles. The principles. The principles used in organic agriculture are the same principles being used in organic life and farming. And this would include, just like many of you know, principles of health, principles of ecology, principles of fairness, and principles of care. And that uh, leading to eventually to what's known as organic life standards. The values in this case would actually differ. Why do they differ? Mainly because of differences in culture and background. And therefore, the standards are not universally recognized. In fact, there are so many national and international standards that I could cite. The most popular of which would be that of IFOAM. IFOAM. In fact, the you know, uh, Agriculture Act of uh, 2010, much of which were actually patterned from IFOAM, IFOAM standards. You might have heard also of the Codex Elementary Standards. The, the Europeans, they have their EU standards. The Americans, they have their own U.S. Department of Agriculture National Organic Program standards. Also from Australia, they have their own. And lo and behold, believe it or not, we have our own also in the Philippines. We have the Philippine National Standards. This was uh, made to uh, the Bureau of Agriculture and Fisheries Product Standards, or the BAS, <laughs> under the Department of Agriculture. Now, a quick comparison of the standards, national, both national and international, will give you the following. That is, there's something common among them. For one, uh, they're common particularly on limits on uh, providing non-organic feed, prohibiting the growth, promote use of growth promoters, prohibiting drugs, especially in the absence of disease. However, there are also some areas that need to be harmonized, like that of housing, uh, the way you find raising areas, the increase of drugs, conversion times, age of meaning, no string of pickets, and so on and so forth. Okay, further observations. Uh, if you look at the iPhone standards, they are more on management. They focus more on management in the physiological and ethological needs. So ethology meaning behavior, the animal behavior. Whereas that from the European Union, the regulations they pour more, pour, pay more attention to the animal uh, ethology, ethological needs as compared to the other standards. And uh, that from the European Union are known to be more detailed, more detailed compared to that of that of the Americans and that from the Australians. The Codex Elementary, on the other hand, now is more environmentally oriented. And this gives the animals a role in closing the nutrient cycle, including soil fertility, through their mature and controlling this through grazing. So maybe just to show you some pictures, no, para hindi naman kayo ang pakemlet. I have a couple of words na makita nyo. I had this picture, uh, I don't know if this doctor Sanjak is around, but uh, I got these pictures from him. This uh, picture taken from the organic native peopling farm they have in Chaong under the BAIBA uh, office in, in Quezon. So this will be their setup. And then they have been also uh, collaborating with some farmers, like this picture I took from uh, Candelaria Quezon, uh, by Denise Ramos, the owner. Uh, where they raise organic native pig farms both on the range and in complete confinement. And then lately I was able to visit the farm of uh, Joel Framo from uh, San Pablo City. And they have also this one. They even have a poster saying, Kaya, go, organic. Kaya, go, organic. Hindi na sabi ba ako mali? Anak organic farms. So I've actually prepared a number of uh, slides and show you also some slides, some pictures, which I took when I was a visiting professor in Germany. But in the uh, organic movement, it's really the advanced stage compared to what we have here. In, in just like many other developing uh, developing countries. So so you have, you have an idea on how it looks like, on how to be in, in an organic farm, livestock, a livestock, because for in general, organic agriculture is mostly crop based. So 80 90% is crops. Uh, less than 10% is you could, uh, or you could find, you could uh, count by your fingers the number of uh, you know, farms which are for, for livestock. So, example, this picture which I took shows you an organic uh, swine farm, uh, organic fine pig farm, the swine soup breeding farm. Uh, in Baden Wattenberg, in uh, Swatchholing, in Germany, say, is uh, using those uh, native pigs, which once upon a time was considered to be already extinct, but they were able to re revive it in the 1980s and then place it in a zoo in uh, Helmina, Wilhelma, Wilhelma Zoo in uh, Stuttgart, Germany. 
and uh, this is how it looks like. Mm -hmm. Okay? It's very similar to what we have. Germany nga lang. Germany. Although wala ko na makita na flag ng Germany dito. So, bubble pa rin. Although, in, 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 uh, by putting red surf in the internet, you can find sim similar mga scenarios like uh, using uh, pigmented mga breeds. Some are actually white. But that, those would involve maybe uh, large tracts of land. And those are actually organic farms. Organic farms. For chickens, uh, I remember 2000, we have this uh, high impact project from BAR. Uh, we have this uh, free range crossbred chickens at the uh, Animal Data Science Cluster. And then I was also able to check the uh, promoter of uh, Sasso Chickens, the late Valley in Central, from Tresa Farms. They're the sole distributor of Sasso. Sasso, mind you, is uh, an acronym for, it's a French acronym for uh, uh, the uh, selected uh, stocks from southwestern France, something like that. But it is S A S S O. And then uh, here we got uh, again from San Pablo, we got a mixed breeds of chickens, yeah. organic. We might have visited the Stalis Farms in Mahaihai, and uh, they've been doing that. And then uh, again, is from uh, Germany. This is actually an example of an organic layer farm. Organic layer farm in uh, Ruthingen in Baden Wattenberg in Germany. And uh, you could actually not see the difference whether it's organic or not by just looking at the pictures. You would think that it's uh, intensive, but it's not. It's organic. And then there are many more pictures, uh, but the common act is that they, they would include large tracts of plants, either for meat production, broilers, or even that for, for layers, for eggs. And I have also visited their uh, state farm, their state farm, highlighting uh, organic production also for, uh, this one is an example of the uh, white and then uh, geese. geese. And then they also have uh, organic farms for uh, Mosley. For Mosley. Uh, and this I took from the Bavarian State Institute for Agricultural, Agriculture Teaching Research and Technical Center in Kitsingen. Kitsingen. And I was also lucky to find an organic daily goat farm. And this was in a uh, owned by Bioland Goat Farm. If you go there in Germany, if you see the word Bioland, for sure, it's, a, it's an organic farm. It's has already uh, patented the word Bio and Bioland. Okay, nobody could use it without uh, getting permission from the uh, owners. And this goat farm is uh, well known for producing uh, cheese from uh, organic goat's milk. Okay, but again, if you look from afar or you get inside, you have to really distinguish which one is organic or which one is not because it's the way you raise animals which comes most. Okay. Let me give you some statistics. Uh, the more recent statistics in 2014 shows that the uh, agricultural land planted for organic is about 80,000 to, compared to 38 million for the whole world. Okay. And most of these are mainly for our crops. And uh, percentage-wise, it's about less than a percent for the Philippines and for the world, it's about 1.87. But look at the other uh, producers, 3,000. Philippines of for the world 1.9 million, so we are a minor player. Organic mar market size, Philippines no data. Per capita consumption, Philippines no data. Now, sa buong mundo, the organic livestock and poultry systems are not as developed no, compared to that of the uh, production and trade of organic, let's say cereals, horticultural, and even textile products. Those are big. Those are big industries. In the Philippines, organic agriculture is a priority program strategy for addressing rural poverty as an alternative low input sustainable agricultural strategy to improve land productivity and protect our environment. I don't know if you encountered this news item. For this year, the Department of Agriculture has in fact earmarked more than 636 million pesos, mainly for R&D programs related to organic farming. I'm not sure whether how much will go to the livestock livestock sector. But that's, that's a lot of money. So it's already devoid of the Napoles fund and then the others. But this is real money very showing us that the government is serious, is serious in really putting up money to develop the organic, uh, the organic sector. Although I have here uh, very old uh, estimates according to DTA estimates as uh, maybe 10 years ago. It's worth 6.2 million, although uh, one third of which for, yeah, one third of which have to discuss from domestic production. And the, the estimated growth rate is approximately 10 to 20 percent 
that's a big number percentage wise but in actual terms that's very very negligible and then uh, we uh, market our products on the end uh, organic markets by direct selling and then usually organic products they have an average of 23 percent price premium over the conventional products and uh, the most important products organic products in the philippines would include banana coconut mango muscovado sugar herbal and food supplements Malaking livestock, malaking livestock. Sana, mabukarin dyan. Worldwide, uh, almost 20% of the global hectares for certified organic land is dedicated to arable agriculture. About 2.3 million hectares of these are for the production of green fodder. In Australia, for example, almost all of which, 12 million hectares, are mainly extensive grazing lands. 12 million hectares. In Argentina, medyo maling kapapit, 3.3 million hectares, konti lang. Uh, and permanent grass land or basic areas. In both Australia and Argentina, the expensive nature of life stock systems is the most suitable management option, particularly in dry conditions. Large farms are typical. In contrast, with these uh, with small holdings, which are uh, also used uh, in arable lands, of course, with a few exceptions. Some more statistics. Uh, the um, organic milk and dairy products, they actually make we constitute a high share of organic products sold in many countries, particularly in Northern Europe. In fact, the dairy products will have uh, market shares of about 5% of all dairy products, or even as high as 10% in Switzerland. For meat products, meat and meat products, we are also considered to be very successful in their, uh, according to them, that is their market shares of around 10%. So percentage sa akin hindi ngayon significantly different, but to them, that's, that's already a lot. And that is particularly in Belgium, the Netherlands, Finland, and France. For eggs, the market shares are up, up to 20%, especially if you go to Switzerland. In around 10%, most countries of the uh, most price storage data was available according to the Organic Data Network survey. Now, what is important here is that how many animals do they have that they have for organic? In Europe, out of all the organic livestock, the major species are cattle and sheep, which are ruminants. No, the most important species, but they only represent nearly 3%, 3% of all of those uh, EU livestock population. For pigs, it's even lower, no? less than 1%, less than 1% in most of the EU member states. In the tropics, the Philippines included, we are producing now and exporting organic agriculture products in ever-increasing quantities. However, they only represent an individual portion of the total livestock production. And this may be due to limited export prospects because of quality control, self-sufficiency in the importing, importing countries. And in the Philippines, there is yet no aggregate study on the scope of organic livestock production. Okay. The next part will show you those regulations. So, so I'll try to put uh, this one. So this one will be the design and management of uh, free range outdoor systems. Starting with the principle in organic livestock production, that is, uh, for one, the, net, the ethological needs of these animals should be respected in order to allow the expression of their natural behavior. So premium uh, emphasis on the word natural behavior. And because of this, the animals must be able to express their natural species-specific behavior, which would imply we should provide them loose housing systems, allow them to go outdoors, give them access to an outdoor ramp or simply pasturing them. And therefore, an extensive ready system for organic types of production would therefore require two things. One would be access to pasture, and second, you have to have the proper housing design where the animals would, uh, would be provided sufficient space. And I have here, instead, uh, I'll just flash it on the screen. I have, uh, I, I'll uh, put this in the, in the uh, monograph that uh, hopefully will be published by, by Circa. I uh, have here some R&D topics that might be pursued in the future for uh, those related topics related to free range and outdoor systems. Second, that about source and origin of adapted uh, breeds and breeding methods. Animal sources. Organic animals should be born and raised under continuous organic management. Technically speaking, this would be uh, up to the last third of the station when you talk of the mammals and then that of attaching when you talk of the uh, birds. Only. And when organic animals are not available in sufficient number, sometimes the non-organic animals may be brought into a holding for, for breeding purposes, especially for those who just be starting out with the, uh, with, with the farm. 
However, they cut off these clone farm animals and their descendants, as well as the use of their products and imports of such animals and products, are not allowed. They're not allowed. Why? Because of the negative effects on animal welfare and ethical concerns. The choice of adaptive breeds also highlights that the breeds that are to be used must be adapted, not must be adapted to the local natural conditions in order to ensure diversity. And this would require the use of a number of breeds, not just one breed. And different types of forage-based livestock may require breeds, different characteristics, and sometimes uh, some breeds may have to be developed to be adapted to a, a broad range of environments. Breeding, breeding as in the reproduction, like the mating uh, system or the mating process. Animals must be able to reproduce independently. Independently, uh, sa animal science, ang tawag namin yan, artificially. But independently, boy, lahat mo sila sa buhay nila. Huwag mong, huwag kang mangingiya lang. Uh, animals should reproduce naturally to express their natural species behavior. And then the breeding methods, reproduction methods, uh, if it's aimed to conserve adapted breeds or for their genetic improvements, they should not depend on high-end artificial breeding technologies. With an exception, the reproductive technologies, with the exception of AI, artificial simulation, is allowed. Are other, all others are not allowed. AI is spreading. Otherwise, the other uh, artificial technologies are known to be detrimental to the welfare and integrity of animals and the naturalness of the biological system. But AI is an exception. Why is it exempted? Allowed definitely because, for one, AI prevents the spread of transmittable labinarian diseases, especially encountered when you exchange bulls or made cows with the neighbor's living bull. Okay? Uh, bulls are also potentially lethal animals, and so that keeping them on the farm would require special skills or practical knowledge. And then uh, third, uh, farmers did not keep as many uh, young stock of males in order to have a good choice of animals you know, on farm breeding, especially in the case of uh, dairy farming. So I have here also a number of uh, RNA topics, like, yeah, uh, three topics under, under one or actually five, I got five items, which I can give to you later. About feeds and feeding strategies, again, for the benefit of our uh, nutrition and friends here in the hall, there are minimum requirements for uh, feed and feeding strategies for that organic livestock production, and I could cite only four. There are four. One is that it should be pasture-based farming, meaning to say there should be higher forage to concentrate ratio, even in the diets. Second, it will promote the use of organically produced feed ingredients. Third, would be to the ban on the use of synthetic amino acids, antibiotics, growth promoters, and other substances intended to stimulate growth or production as feed additives. And then the last one is to minimize the risk of GMO contamination of the protein sources. Although technically, almost 98% of the feed ingredients that we import not with the corn, soya, or uh, and, and many more are actually products of GMO. No, but it's not the necessary bag that's going to be regulated on you know, content. And there are many uh, topics that I've uh, enumerated here, like uh, putting up those uh, demonstration plants with the dirty nutrient content of organic growth grown feed traps, uh, scope of homegrown feeds, uh, defined feed sources that would have higher energy to amino acid ratio, uh, fight protein sources that will compensate synthetic amino acids that are usually excluded in organic feed diets, before high density diets, which anyway are being done by, uh, by nutritionists. So it's nothing new. That for animal health and welfare concerns will be the next one. That is, uh, when we say animal welfare, it's uh, three things. One is that uh, you avoid suffering the animals. Second is sustain fitness. And third is that animal abuse in any form should not be tolerated. And that is uh, how welfare is being defined. In fact, those in our organic livestock agriculture uh, would uh, provide animal suffering naps, and this was defined by the Farm Animal Welfare Council uh, five years ago. And that is, uh, you have to find, provide freedom from hunger and thirst, freedom from discomfort, freedom from pain, injury, disease, freedom from fear and distress. Uh, poverty, incidents in Filipinas, no? freedom, pare-pareho rin eh, hunger, thirst, kaya lang, animals ang pinag-usapan natin, tao. Uh, 
something. Animal welfare are also related to health problems and their control, and this could usually be related to two things. One, those things are to be covered under veterinary medicine, and the second will be issues about mutilations, starting with the veterinary medicine. I'm not a veterinarian, but according to the literature, the major health issues pertain mainly to two things. One will be the control or treatment program against parasitic infection, usually encountered in organic life safari. And second, the use of the phytotherapeutic or the homeopathic products from medicinal plants, ethno-veterinary, and then the use of uh, prophylactic antibiotics is prohibited. In fact, antibiotics for that matter are discouraged, except in medical emergencies where you can use for curative purposes that an animal is so ill that its welfare is at stake. The next issue would be about mutilations. Animals may not be mutilated. Mutilated. Why? Because mutilation compromises the animal's welfare and integrity. Although some, some professors, I think, they also consider this in their lectures when they put up those animal production courses, maybe for swine, cattle, or for poultry. The horns, the tails, the pig should remain intact, not necessarily the same animal. The horns, the tail, the pig should remain intact, but steps should be taken to prevent animals from injuring one another. The exceptions, so there are exceptions for mutilations. For example, if you practice castration, tail ducking, horning, and uh, nose ringing, they could be done, but should be give, but animals should be given. Should only be given when suffering can be minimized. Many anesthetics uh, whenever appropriate. So again, there are many uh, topics to be pursued, like the new animal welfare standards. What are the practical and objective measures of animal welfare? So the present is not really that defined. Biological control of parasites, new healthcare protocols, and even the use of HACCP, no, HACCP, particularly monitoring and controlling. Uh, the risk factors related to, uh, related to health. And then the fifth one, would that have something to do with organic certification issues? It's a very big issue. But in uh, certification is an essential element for any country wishing to either export, but not only for export, even if you develop your own internal or domestic market. It got certification guarantees not only the quality of the product, but, it got, but also the quality of the production, handling, processing, and the marketing continuum under organic in other words, the production methods are certified. The certified methods, not the product, to be safe and sound and also environmentally friendly. And uh, take note also that the organic label is a process claim. It's a process claim rather than a product claim. It's a product uh, process claim. And it should not be interpreted to mean that the foods that are produced are actually healthier, safer, or entirely natural. Okay, it's the process that is being certified. It simply means that the products follow the defined standards of production and handling, and even processing, especially those involved in meat processing and the daily the technology. They have their own standards also for organic uh, for the organic systems. And then the organic standards does not also, also accept the producers and the processors from compliance with general requirements for statutory regulations such as food safety, pesticide registration, general food and nutritional labeling rules, etc. And uh, while I was doing this, I tried to surf the internet and I tried to come up with uh, some labels or tags that are usually associated with the uh, organic uh, livestock farming. And I have counted, I have counted at least about 32, about 32, not pwedeng ginagamit. Yun, uh, dito yung free, maki na yan, nilalating na ako, yung organic natin yung ginagawa mo pag meron ka mga gantong terms. Chemical okay, free, earthly, ecological, eco-friendly, GMO free, free range, green, healthy, Natural, non synthetic, general, production free, probiotic, produced by nature, etc. But all of these are constituted actually organic, organic livestock farming. So, ilang ko, 32 at least, makita ko. The sad part is, if you check the third part the list of those uh, local producers that were certified, third, third party certified, I took this from the Philippines of this story, to that organic agriculture production survey, there are only a few of them. In fact, I counted them, there are 10, many of which are from Western Visayas because of the NICER, the Negros Island Certification System. And I was told that not, not much has been added to the list since 2013. So not, not too many people are really into certification. So in this regard, I have come up with some list of uh, other topics uh, like, like how to reduce cost of certification, uh, marketing and promotional techniques, find ways of uh, easier ways of certification, perhaps recognition and equivalent 
equivalence arrangements and the like. Okay. Now, for the third part of the lecture, is a uh, life cycle study. Starting with the genetic resources, uh, what genetic resources are we supposed to use in organic farming? There are only two. There are to be classified into two. One is that you could make use of the imported high yielding livestock breeds and hybrid lines. Okay. And second will be the local or your indigenous livestock breeds. Uh, the next table actually shows you a comparison of the type of uh, genotypes that are being used in uh, conventional as opposed to organic for the different farm animals, cattle, buffaloes, sheep, goats, pigs, and chickens. But what should be highlight, highlighted here is that under organic production systems, all of them will be both local indigenous breeds. Okay, local indigenous breeds. For one, uh, let's start with the first one. Those are uh, important breeds and hybrid lines. They are genetically uniform for sure. They are now supplied by only a few globally operating genetic companies. The sad part is, uh, these are based only on a handful of breeds. Handful of breeds of cattle, pigs, and chickens. Okay? And the high yields are usually realized in conventional farming. These are appear to be exclusive to the breeds, and we call them your conventional breeding stock. Okay? Many, many uh, big, big, big farms. And just to show you an uh, idea on the, uh, those companies involved worldwide, you could count by your, num by your fingers the number of uh, breeding companies involved. Let's say for cattle, uh, the, main, uh, the main companies are that coming from Canada, from the US, from Denmark. Uh, yeah, Denmark. Cmex, Dansire, and all the genetics, you know, still see when they sell those different cement for, for, for ruminants. For pigs, we have the main players like the top PIC, top pigs that bred high for mainly from uh, Netherlands, uh, of course UK, Canada, and uh, Denmark. For chickens and uh, other poultry species like that of Turkey, we have here a number, uh, Habar, Kabbalah, and Figajem, but they're mainly controlled by those people from France, from the US, from Germany, from Canada, and of course from the UK and they control the uh, production of these uh, high-performing or high-yielding uh, resources. However, in, the, in these countries that I have mentioned, there are ethical concerns. There are ethical concerns, especially in using those uh, high-yielding uh, breeding stock, mainly because they will lead to the loss of diversity in the livestock breeds. As I said, only a few handful of uh, breeds are actually being uh, uh, maintained by these uh, breeding companies. And then these conventional breeding animals, are known to have a very high genetic predisposition for production and therefore they would require high quality feed and concentrates which we do not always provide in organic farms because they're not available, they're expensive. Besides, this would also lead to health and fertility problems and this has been documented and they would also require intensive veterinary management. The conventional breeding stock also lack the characteristics of which are desirable in organic systems putting the animal welfare at stake. For example, uh, when we talk about the modern pigs that we have, they are known to have very little body hair, short snout, which makes them less capable of coping with the sun and the heat if you put them on an outside run. They also have relatively less body fat to protect them from the cold, especially if you place them in temperate conditions. For cows, or sick cows, they have long, dangerously formed horns, which increase body injuries, for hence, they've got negative pecking behavior and cannibalism occur. And as a result, the consequence of this is that these animals are actually being mutilated. They're being mutilated to prevent the onset of such undesirable behavior characteristics that are being practiced, in, that are found in a conventional uh, farming. So, can a cattle run mutilations? So, many lives of creatures strains developed for these uh, farms may also be not adapted to the organic, especially for the uh, low input farming system. And this will imply an economic risk, especially for the resource for smallholder uh, farmers. Let's go to the adapted ones. The adapted uh, local breeds. Uh, um, for one, many, despite the rapid industrialization of the sector, many local breeds are still being kept by smallholder farmers. They predominate the domestic animal production in many developing countries, the Philippines included. They are commonly regarded as local or native. Now, the local or native a specific area and raised using traditional production technologies by most village households. 
The sad part is there's no structured animal breeding program that exists to improve their genetic traits. They also exist in small numbers and have generally been kept by only a small number of villagers. And even though they represent an important source of meat, milk, and eggs for most of the rural population, these local breeds are not considered the main source of family earnings. They are not also able to provide the domestic consumption on a daily basis. Why? Because of their low productivity and variability performance. However, the local breeds are not to be seen as impediments in development. In fact, it's the other way around. The local breeds are the ones that are known to be socially and culturally acceptable. In fact, they symbolize our natural heritage, either food, agriculture, or cultural heritage. And they matter as the bedrock of identity, as well as life of any society and nation. Especially in organic farming, which shows also a profound cultural sensitivity and historical mindedness. And that's why nowadays, many more local and native breeds seem to be used, or at least expected, in organic farms than in conventional farms. Why? Maybe because one, they're able to utilize low, lower quality feed. Second, they are more resilient to climatic stress. Third, they are more resistant to local parasites and diseases. At least that's a perception. Hence, we ensure the healthy and stressy animals. And the need for the allopathic medicines and antibiotics is much lower. And therefore, local breeds are and should therefore be preferred in order to save them. And this also contributes to better recognition of organic production, especially when it promotes some multifunctional farms. And local breeds are also the basis of livelihoods, which could help achieve our objectives in food security. However, uh, let me remind you that when we develop them through science and technology undertakings, uh, this is a good aim uh, towards technical excellence, but all of this, uh, at all times, it has to be done ethically. That's the main, that's the main uh, background, the, the main spirit behind the organic, the organic movement. It has to be done ethically. Uh, I have also to show you how, how many local breeds we have here in the region in Southeast Asia. There are many, uh, with the exception, of course, from Brunei, uh, Singapore, and Timor Leste, which could get this from, from the internet, from uh, the Dalits, from the Domestic Animal Diversity Program of FAO. I hear the numbers numbers of local breeds that we have for ruminants, for pigs, for chickens, and ducks. The ones in blue would tell you that these are countries where you could find them the most. Like, for example, in terms of cattle, the, the most number of cattle in Southeast Asia is found in Indonesia. And so as with goats, and the that is in Indonesia. The most number of chickens, inventory-wise, are also in Indonesia. But look at the diversity of the local breeds. So many, even ducks, even that pigs. Go for Lao, Malaysia, Myanmar, and Mars in blue because they have the most number of buffalo now in Southeast Asia. They have overtaken the Philippines about two years ago. And I, I was telling uh, students before that, and that, that, that would uh, justify why we have a Philippine cattle center. But now it's not the Philippines. It's to find most of the buffaloes in, in Myanmar. And then for the Philippines, uh, you only have a small number which were actually documented, compared that to Indonesia, Thailand, for example, uh, Vietnam. Vietnam is in blue, maybe because you could find there the most number of pigs in Vietnam. And so as with ducks, ducks, for example, they have about 10, uh, 10 million. There, they have three times, 30 million. I'm sorry, for pigs. They have, they have 10 million, 30 million for, for pigs in Vietnam. But look at those uh, diversity of those uh, local breeds. We conserve them. Uh, why? Uh, theoretically, this diversity was brought about by uh, evolution, adaptation uh, of these uh, animals. In fact, this would include the development of a few breeds into breeding lines. These were done mainly by breeding cooperatives, the government breeding organizations, and breeding companies, especially in North America, based in Canada, and Europe. That's why we have these uh, industrial uh, breeds being used in uh, animal production. However, for us geneticists, it has also be, also, uh, been emphasized that still the potential for genetic improvement has been exploited only to a very limited degree. Limited degree. But that is not going to end. And furthermore, the sad part here is that the adapted local breeds that we have could easily be irretrievably lost. No? 
especially if you compare them and found them to be non-competitive compared with their, their uh, commercial counterparts. So, if you're not careful, then doon talaga tayo pupunta, mawawala rin yung mga local breeds. And therefore, the maintenance of this local breeds is therefore imperative. No? It's very important to maintain this genetic diversity. How do you manage genetic diversity? There are many actions to be done to maintain diversity as part of a national program for livestock production. And this would start usually with the establishment of a gene pool, a genetic pool, of those breeds of stock. So, when we, when we could select desirable traits, in collaboration with those subject associations and local producers. And uh, some of the considerations will be the following, like uh, the situation that the reason you ch choose should be better adapted to what we have locally, production marketing system, which should be well suited to free range systems. We also situate that the local breed should be continuously exposed to the local conditions so to maintain their unique adaptive traits. And then they should be maintained in closed herds and flocks. And fourth, is where these breeds must be linked with the local marketing to account for the special quality uh, livestock products and uh, to protect their geographical indications and designations of origins, just like what they do in Europe. In, in Europe, they, they put up these uh, EU quality labels, just like uh, they put up this protected designation of origin, where they give this to, to uh, produce and process up to finish product stage to define areas named the product pairs. Then we have the PGI, the protected uh, geographical Asians produce in the geographical region of whose name it bears. So, for example, we could come up and say, who knows, maybe I could produce a Sikohor roast beef, or maybe a black chaong native bacon, yung tabilang BT pigs, as in black chaong, in the Asian GMO. But uh, we could put up those names, and the, the more recent of which is that of the TSG, or the Traditional Specialty Guarantee, which highlights the traditional character, either in composition or the means of production. And these are mainly to, to help support and protect and promote our local staff, hopefully leading to these uh, seals, to mga labels for PDOs, PGIs, and PSGs. Genetic improvement is the field. So for one, building should be based on the principle of naturalness. And this is where the difference would be for a uh, conventional and the organic. Uh, uh, it should be done within the organic chain, separately from the conventional sector. In layman's terms, this is what it means. No? That is, breeding is only organic if the breeding animals and their families are kept and housed in organic conditions. That's a requirement. That's a requirement. And the main breeding strategies are the same. You end up with one, coming up with a selection program within the breed. Second, cross-breeding. Cross-breeding. The only thing that we need to do is that not only to ensure farm profitability, but there are some additional uh, Objective is that if we safeguard animal health and welfare, we focus on conserving genetic diversity, and we promote human health no? uh, in, in, in compliance with the uh, principles of uh, organic life and farming. Starting with the organization structure, uh, for smallholder farmers, they must no? they must form into groups. They must form into groups for cooperatives, and they could, should follow a common breeding objective. A good example would be a farm-specific breeding program, just like the CDO gene that they have uh, demonstrated uh, in, uh, in Africa and also in some parts of Southeast Asia, particularly Vietnam and in Thailand. It's a community-based organization for the genetic improvement of livestock. And it's known to be less dependent on conventional uh, institutional structures, which ensures more diversity within breeds and encourages the use of local breeds. Second, the uh, in terms of the breeding objective, so unlike the conventional uh, breeding systems, wherein you have a limited number of things considered, for organic livestock farming, we may consider a broader range of traits or attributes. Mas madami, mas madami. In fact, we could foresee a shift in the selection criteria from the simple feed conversion to some functional efficiency and other traits related to fitness. And I have here on the, on the screen, some possible uh, breeding objectives that may be pursued to improve our local animals or local breeds are not actually being uh, pursued in conventional uh, breeding programs. So you can go for disease assistance, vitality, fertility, mother ability, even walking ability. Walking ability, etc. So what the breeding organization should do should be to help these farmers need to select and make those uh, sires from their own herds with the best 
building values so the same procedure and then uh, perhaps one, one thing that might be considered would be to put up a uh, local program for uh, animals that are known for uh, disease resistance and uh, this is being done actually in, in other countries just to show you uh, some pictures again like uh, in Europe they've done this uh, all in fish animals. of course it originated from or steam Holland Holland you might have also heard Holstein is made for uh, milk production this one is a picture of uh, the shadow lab from France for beef organic organic systems uh, the other one is uh, the brown Swiss of course Swiss coming from Switzerland Switzerland and then uh, and this one I, I saw this myself uh, this is a dwarf uh, milk breed found in the black forest in Germany high yielding uh, uh, native native uh, cattle but it's a baby type and there are some selection programs mainly for organic production systems and even for pigs you might have heard about the Iberian pigs coming from Spain the Iberian Peninsula and this is how they look like for, for organic production they have also the Mangalitsa from Hungary and then you have the Sinta Senese from Italy. Italy. So these are local breeds. And from Germany, they have the Benheim Black Pie. And the more popular, the Swedish Hanisches uh, Lunch Wine. Germany, they look very, very uh, similar. And they even have the seal of mga European quality seals. Just like, of course, the one I showed you earlier, that about the Iberian pigs from, from uh, Spain. And they're the ones where you get the, the famous Hamon Iberico, which are very, very expensive, mind you. If you could look closely, that one is about 95 euro per kilogram. Times 50. You get an idea how these how this organic products are, and they're very expensive. The other part of the, the breeding program would be cross-breeding system. Of course, and, and everyone else has to take advantage of having vigor and heterosis. But just to give you some, some uh, uh, practices that they've been uh, doing, like say in pigs, uh, in pigs it's very similar to conventional, that is uh, you come up, choose the, the maternal breed with good modeling ability, good fertility, calm temperament, good life and performance, and then you make it with the paternal breed. And it's known to have uh, high potential for growth and a uh, good carcass performance. And the production animals, which should not be used for breeding, usually we call them the terminal cross. They are usually the F2 generation, and they are usually a result of a three-way or four-way process. So that's being practiced. And uh, many organic swine farms are now have relied also on the commercial hybrids, but there's preference mainly for the pigmented breeds. So, like example, the use of the uh, the colored breeds like that of Duro, Duro is a colored one, Berkshire also black breed. And then the local uh, pigmented breeds, so there's a preference for those uh, that are not, not white. For chickens, uh, starting with the meat type for broilers, there have been uh, slow growing strains that suitable for organic production that have been developed by some old breeding companies, just like that of Sasso and Hubbard, both from France, and then the Avigen from the Great Britain, and the Calvantes from USA. So, when in uh, the trees that have been uh, improve something to do with the uh, slow growing we have to have good social and ranging behavior robust and low requirements of feed quality and unlike conventional broilers which are ready for 42 days six weeks after hatching these organic broilers are fatted up to 81 days uh, at the uh, close to 12 uh, 12 days 12 days although on the average these birds grow to as big as two kilograms in eight weeks and they're big like, and I've seen them, although I would not say I tasted them because they're expensive, you cannot afford. But, but I've seen them, I've seen them. Now, for the layers, for, for the eggs, it's a different story, it's a different story. For the conventional layer production, it involves the development of lines coming mainly from the side single comb white egg worm, especially if you're to produce the white eggs. For those intending to produce the brown eggs, the solids are based mainly on crosses between the ear. RIRs or the Rhode Island Press, and then they part the most tracks, the PPRs, you end up with the brown eggs. Okay. Unfortunately, 
there is still limited suitability of these conventional strains selected for high egg production na cage housing system because these are being uh, housed in battery cages and if you are to use them in organic production hindi pa pwede why? because in organic production just like what's happening right now the laying batteries are actually being phased out being phased out and this allowed because they compromise the hen's welfare and that's where the difference main is so layers but not necessarily for, for the broilers in the Philippines I'd like to highlight some of the works that we've had like uh, we've done crossbreeding uh, of native chickens like the Parawakan from Palawan and the Dalaba from Batangas we crossed this with the Sassorian chickens from Bobby Vicencio and this have resulted sorry, this have resulted in improved uh, performance of the F1 process and we've documented that especially for in the case of renewability and production rates. And uh, that's the thesis of uh, my uh, late friend, Rep. Nakisubin. Okay, uh, yun yung ginawa ng kanyang fish thesis. And then, uh, although if you are to do crossbreeding in small other farms, uh, I think the crossbreeding programs being practiced in large farms may not actually be suitable for small other farms. The main problem there is numbers, herd size. That you don't have the numbers for replacement purebred females, more so with the males coming from different breeds. So in simple uh, copy from large commercial farms, I don't think would work. Besides, talk of mammals, uh, more purebred sires would be used, the bulls, the bucks, or the, the horse would be used, mainly because uh, AI is used uh, at a very low, uh, low, there's this low usage rate and success rate of AI particularly in the village uh, herds. That's why we have no choice but simply to, to, uh, to do not practice natural maintaining. Okay. And nonetheless, technically, still we could come up with cross training programs, but we could just uh, limit it to simply upgrading, or if we have uh, the, the uh, infrastructure, we could put up a formation of composite uh, comps grid. For G by interaction, as of now, there's still no scientific research to tell us whether the trace selected in conventional uh, programs could be used in uh, organic agriculture. Although the hypothesis is that there, these differences are to be expected, especially with regards to those traits are related to functional characteristics just like fertility, disease resistance, and behavior. So we need to still have a lot of research to do this. But just to be safe, the best thing to do then is just simply select the best animals which are optimally adapted to a specific condition on the farm. The species to uh, farm specific na mga breeding program ang dagat. Okay, the last part, uh, the lecture, uh, consumer demand. Uh, why, why is there this demand for uh, organic livestock products? Uh, two things. First is uh, it's mainly because of uh, health and product safety reasons. Second, wider benefits such as protecting the environment and then the animals. Okay, and then this increase in demand is basically a response. No, for our notion that, uh, yeah, for our idea that the factory farm methods and conventional uh, programs are responsible for our problems like public health threats, ecological problems concerning air, water pollution, and even the loss of uh, diversity. And there is also a growing international scientific consensus that the genetically modified products and the corresponding genetic modification involved may raise many risks, not many risks, over conventional breeding approaches. About prospects, prospects is this, uh, I think smallholders could become important suppliers of organic foods. Why? Mainly because the practices tend to suit the conditions under which this livestock and poultry animals are actually being raised, being raised by smallholder farmers. In fact, smallholder farmers in, uh, in uh, poor countries are closer to practicing organic farming system, but by default, no? but largely by default. Why? Because they traditionally use or few external inputs, such as allopathic medicines and antibiotics, and anyway, they follow grazing based extensive or semi intensive production systems. So, there are version of the this. Okay? Small older livestock keepers have also developed a vast veterinary knowledge, no? and this is some easier for some farmers to understand. That's why it's been, been, been used as a tool for poverty alleviation, particularly in the rural areas. And uh, smallholder farmers, the important thing is traditional knowledge okay, of the natural environment, the unique relationships that exist between crops, animals, and the environment. 
which sa tingin ko, mas madami sila na lang kaysa kung sa mga nagtuturo kagaya mo sa animal animal science. Just have to ask them. And then, uh, if you are using indigenous ingredients generated from the integrated graph animal systems, then I don't think there will be shortage of organic feed. You should rely maybe on imported cereals or, or uh, and oil meals. And those uh, farmers who have this uh, holistic mind, no, understanding of organics and are focused on local benefits, and not simply uh, just on the premium price for livestock, I guess these are the ones that would have, uh, uh, are likely to be better, better with study setbacks, reduced premiums, and difficult periods, especially during one person's savings, because they understand. It's definitely a matter of uh, profit. And uh, yeah, I'd like to highlight this. Uh, organic Life Farm also promotes technologies and best practices. So this is no different from what we've been teaching in class. Uh, they're graduate, graduate. In fact, I would go on further no? that it could be used mainly to not allow farmers to earn more, but also protect the environment. Just like what uh, Dr. Gerber and his group has promoting. We simply want to improve the breeding health of animals, better access to affordable improved animals, use better quality feeds and better grazing management to reduce the methane emissions, to recover and recycle nutrients and energy containing the manure, and last, use less energy along the livestock production chain, all of which would fall in the organic livestock principles. The same things that we're promoting also in basic animal production courses. So it's not really that new. Impacts. The impacts will be as follows. Food security, uh, many of you are familiar with food security. I have stayed with the Food Security Center for one year, one of the top 10 exceed programs, traffic programs in Europe, uh, what food security is. And uh, what I would like to highlight is the, those four pillars of food security, because that's really defined. Uh, it's when you say food security, we talk about food availability, we talk about food access, we talk about food stability, we talk about food utilization. And along this line, I'd like to highlight that organic livestock farming will contribute to this end. Like for example, it could be used mainly to increase product, production and productivity, it could generate income and employment, it could promote fair trade and marketing practices, it could provide adequate food at all times, ensure food safety and nutritional well-being. In other words, it's really a tool to attain our objectives in food security. The last part is actually, I'd like to combine both. Uh, I would like to end with recommendations as they would, uh, as they would uh, face some constraint uh, in relation to the constraints faced by the small holder organic livestock producers. And I have lined up only four. Let's not name them. So one, the constraint is basically one, a limited amount of truly scientific research. No? Emphasis on the word truly. No? Truly scientific research on organic technology, especially under small scale farming conditions. Recommendation? We promote education, research, and development activities on organic livestock farming at the smallholder farm level. How do we do that? Uh, education programs. So this could be include putting up joint curriculum courses, offering at the undergraduate, graduate levels with the different state colleges and universities, perhaps in partnership with foreign uh, universities, and even with TESDA, for example, industry government academic partnerships and hope. Hopefully in the future, we could come up with a national conference or even an ASEAN conference on organic livestock farming and exchange researches being practiced by colleges and universities. For R&D activities, we could start by putting up theses, dissertations, laboratory field experiments, demo farms, participatory community-based research, EDS, special delivery services, and we could do this in collaboration with the Organic Agriculture RD Network based at BAR, RDA or with the Organic Farm Information Network based on PICARD in uh, of QSD. Second, the same, inaccessibility of organic markets to most small farmers and the difficulty of small farmers have in negotiating contracts with buyers. Recommendation is uh, perhaps to develop niche markets for smallholders to improve the value of these uh, organic types of products. Second, to provide policy development support for smallholder farmers to join industry government academic initiatives. Uh, we should promote, we should promote the traditional products. We should create new products to improve their quality, we develop markets, and those are all good strategies we need to conserve our traditional or our local breeds. If we'll be successful in doing all of this, then I'll be happy because we conserve the animals anyways. And we do this, uh, we 
perhaps you could follow the, the example of uh, those uh, European particulators like those PPOs, PGIs, and then the TSGs, and then uh, and remember, these smallholder, smallholder farmers, they must be organized. They must be organized. They must be organized to Third problem, difficulty in access to, uh, difficult access to adapted animal breeds. Recommendation, we provide access to adapted animal breeds. How do we do this? I propose that the national bidding for organic livestock farming no, anchored on a national organic livestock database, NOLD, just like what they do in Europe, okay, should be pursued mainly as a joint effort of smallholder farmers with the organization, UPLB, UPLB, of course, our uh, brothers and sisters from the other state colleges and universities. But this has to be led and coordinated by the various life agencies of the Department of Agriculture. Example, uh, if you talk about other buffaloes, then we go into PCC, the European Animal Center. If you talk of daily cattle, then we talk of the National Data Authority. And then the remainder, lahat ng may iba, then BAI. No, uh, that's for the cattle, horses, goats, pigs, chickens, and ducks. So, in yung uh, proposal, then we do an honest to put this uh, program. And then the last issue is that of high cost of certification. And that is the recommendation is to reduce the cost of organic certification for smallholder farmers. Uh, the obvious well, the obvious alternative would be uh, to apply for group certification. In other words, we have to organize the smallholder farmers and apply for orga for group certification. So that you facilitate what is known as the ICS or the internal control systems because it will turn out to be cheaper in the long run. Pagmadami kayo. Although alternatively, or something that more practically, we could make this of what's known as the PGS. I don't know if you've heard about PGS, Participatory Guarantee System. It's a locally focused quality assurance system with certified producers based on active participation of stakeholders. And these are built mainly on the foundation of trust, networks, and knowledge exchange. And this actually being promoted mainly by, by, uh, by local uh, NGOs such as Nasulpan. And then third, uh, Recommendations, maybe you could uh, come up with uh, bilateral, country to country, or multilateral recognition, and equivalent arrangements. And this could be solved through the uh, POROS, uh, the Common Objectives and Requirements of Organic Standards. So, going back to PGS, uh, I'm, I'm very proud to, to tell you that for, in the case of PGS, the Philippines is the leading country in the world in terms of the number of producers involved in PGS. You know, out of to close to 49,000 small operators all over the world. 10,000 or about 20% of these are found in the Philippines. Found in the Philippines, PGS. Although, karami naman yan, puro crops. And as of last year, I was talking to a friend, the Chito Medina, the National Coordinator for Pharmacipa. He said that a total of 105, 109 farm organizations are been using the Masipa Farmers Guarantee System. They're not the ones certifying, they just uh, help those uh, farmer groups put up their own certification system. And it's a lot cheaper compared to going to a third party uh, certification. Although I heard that if uh, you do not comply with the third party uh, certification requirement, then you could not market your uh, products with the term organic. But the product is so expensive. Although I was asking uh, people, I was telling them, oh, by yung magpa-certify. No, mahal. At ano naman ang talo mo doon? Kasi ang talo mo lang naman doon is uh, if you don't get certified, you don't get subsidies from the government following the Organic Agriculture Act. But sabi ng iba, wala naman kami nakukuha ngayon eh. So why? Why bother? So yun yung mga mga nakikita ng iba mga tao. But still, any organic uh, livestock farming farming uh, na principle would definitely require certification and with that, yeah, I, I, I'd like to, to finish the, uh, the lecture and I'd like to flash my, uh, my email ad, my email ad. So for some of you who want to talk some more about organic livestock farming, you may contact me with this, uh, with this uh, address. Uh, I have just, I'll, I'll be submitting a monograph copy of this presentation. Hopefully, it's here with David uh, published. And I have to read it with you. Uh, hoping that uh, sure, you could get a copy of this uh, in the future. So with that, thank you so much. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Dr. Bondo. Our discussion for today's lecture is uh, Dr. Mary Jean Gibolato from the Agricultural Systems Cluster. So I invite her on uh, stage. Thank you, uh, Professor Dabo. Um, good afternoon, yes, fellow uh, researchers, faculty members, students, ladies and gentlemen. I think I have to make this quick because I know many of you are ex excited to uh, ask your questions to Dr. Bondo. So, but first and foremost, I wish to congratulate and commend Dr. Bondo, Dr. Orville and Bondo for coming up with quite a comprehensive and a scholarly manuscript and presentation in his circa professorial chair lecture pertaining the topic Organic Livestock Farming and Breeding Towards Food Security of Smallholder Farmers in the Tropics. The presentation and the manuscript, the manuscript, I, I was able to read the manuscript, uh, is expected to be well written, as expected, well written and well organized, and provided us with a wide range of important information which uh, is easy to understand um, and will surely benefit and be appreciated by technical and non-technical reader, readers alike. By easy to understand, I mean not so heavy with technical jargons, uh, when, let's say, breathing, you know, uh, at the same time retaining its scientific personality. The information contained in the manuscript will be an excellent reference uh, materials for students Researchers, policy pushers, and policy makers who are engaged and intending to get engaged in organic agriculture, particularly organic livestock production. So that presentation, as you have heard and seen, uh, covered, reviewed, not just the breeding part, but the major issues in organic livestock production in relation to food security. The presentation importantly indicated the state of organic livestock production in the Philippines and the region. Uh, the constraints faced by smallholder organic uh, livestock producers, and finally, it provided important recommendations with regard to uh, helping achieve the ultimate goal of uh, helping smallholder farmers produce organic livestock food products that appeal to consumers, adhere to local conditions or regulations, rather, and retain product quality and be widely available in different regions at a fair price. Quote at quote, that was quote at quote. With that, I feel I have no more to say, given the comprehensive presentation of Dr. Bondo. However, being here, I have to say something, right? <laughs> so, uh, as I have very limited knowledge in animal breeding, I will confine my discussion to the items I am more familiar with, uh, and with which I have seen in the limited engagement I have with smallholder organic livestock farmers. I will leave discussion on the more complex topic of animal breeding to the experts, many experts present in the uh, audience. I would like to raise a few points. Now, this may not be major points to some, uh, but certainly they are to the smallholder organic livestock farmers. Dr. Bondo emphasized that organic livestock food production need a strong connection to the market in order for this to be beneficial economically. This is very true. However, this is almost always linked to compliance with the set standards for organic livestock production, which, as he said, and as in reality, smallholder farmers have difficult complying. I have seen smallholder organic producers initially be excited in going into organic livestock production in the hope of improving income because of the promise of premium prices. No, but only to find out that premium prices are reserved for those whose production are certified. No, so maybe uh, if a uh, 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 third party, uh, maybe for third party, no, but uh, however, PGS for livestock have yet to be developed, I think, no? So the PGS available are for mostly for crops. So maybe, uh, I'm not sure if it is uh, some or there is already an existing PGS for livestock. So, um, so in effect, some end up disappointed when, our, when their uncer uncertified organic pro produce end up with the same prices as products of conventional farming and consequently getting lower income as some have initially lower productivity, no? initial productivity with conversion to organic farming. On the other hand, the issue of premium prices 
for organic produce and the goal of making organic produce available to all at fair prices should also be threaded in a balancing act. Uh, I have read information from Dr. Bonto's manuscript and other literatures that some organic farmers in some parts of Europe drop out of organic farming because of failing prices for organic products or organic produce. It may happen in our condition given that the cost of conver conversion and certification is not a small matter to our smallholders. Adding to that is that certification is renewable every three years. The question I will pose to you uh, now is, should the premium prices for organic produce be maintained in order to benefit smallholder producers economically? Or shall we aim for reduced or fair prices so that organic produce will be available to all and do not remain in the niche markets, thereby possibly becoming less attractive to some organic smallholders producers, especially you know, Especially that organic production may need more land, no more land, labor, and there are still challenges in the production side. It's still on certification and standardization. The organic livestock farming with its standardized and certified methods of production, storage, processing, and transport may become a two-edged sword for smallholder farmers. On one edge, if done properly and with the necessary support in place, it can lead to food security and healthy unproductive life, quote unquote, from Dr. Bondo. On the other edge is the possibility of the farmers reverting back to conventional practice if the, base, if the basic household needs are not met. Because we're talking about smallholders, so this is possi possible if market and support systems lag behind, especially during transition period as the smallholders have very small buffer for risks. Support system available in time may be in the form of suitable technologies for organic livestock production. The suitable breeds that uh, Dr. Bolt Bolt is uh, talking about, organic feed resources, alternative health programs, uh, to name a few. Other support system may be a form of incentive mechanisms, buffer source during transition period, availability of local markets or marketing mechanism, the subsidized cost of certification, although which this is, I think, is being provided by the law. Although, as we have heard earlier, we have it, it's not happening, no? Uh, otherwise, if there are, uh, these are not available, only selected farmers with some amount of assets and buffer resources can benefit from this, no? With the exclusion of the heavy small, uh, of the many smallholders. Another issue here is the transition period of two to three years, where in productivity may be reduced by 25 to to 50 percent. This is according to literature. No? Smallholder farmers need a transition source of income to supplement the already meager income they have for engaging in organic production. During conversion period or transition, a small farm households should be able to support household requirements. Uh, therefore, programs should include a transition source of income to compensate the initial reduction in the productivity. Dr. Bondok also emphasized the need for breeding strategies and breeds adapted to organic production because there are setbacks in uh, using available conventional breeds, not in organic livestock production. For instance, he, he said that uh, high yielding breeds may not perform well in low input system. So this is a possible economic risk for the farmers. He recommended several breeding objectives for organic livestock production. I would like to add that a multi-stakeholder participatory system may be employed, especially establishing and prioritizing the breeding objectives of the community. Uh, it is also worthwhile to note that in uh, organic livestock production, land holding and land tenure as is a limiting factor or constraint for smallholder livestock farmers. This is <laughs> This is particularly oh, I'm almost over. This is particularly important because of the idea that in organic livestock production, as much as possible, feeds are produced sourced within the farm. No, so while this will ensure that feeds are grown organically, be it intentionally or produced through the use of product uh, or, or byproducts from organic production, the size and type of land holdings is an important aspect on whether a farm will be able to carry the requirement of a mixed organic farm uh, operations given its limitations. In the Philippines, smallholder farmers have less than three hectares of land holdings. 
uh, and majority heavily depend on family labor for the whole farm operations. This is probably one of the reasons why many smallholders consider organic livestock production or organic agriculture for that matter an expensive and labor intensive operation. In order to be certified and be ensured that feeds are produced organically, they may have to produce and possibly process their feeds in the farm, which will entail additional labor costs along the way. Crop residues may not suffice and may not last until the next harvest season. So most smallholder organic livestock raisers see the production of organic feeds within the farm as labor intensive, which significantly take a good chunk from the labor resource. Otherwise, used for crop production because usually the main enterprise is crop production. Production of organic feeds therefore needs a sufficient plant resource and additional labor and probably cash investment. This is being complicated further by territorial status as decisions with regards to land use cannot be exclusively made by the smallholders. They have to seek approval from the landowners who may or may not have similar inclination towards organic agriculture. This has to be considered in implementing programs for organic and livestock production. Okay. Last page. <laughs> uh, these are just some additional points which I think have to be addressed as well in order for the organic livestock farming to help in achieving food security for the smallholder farmers in the tropics. Lastly, I appreciate the part in which Dr. Bondo identified the research and development topics or the research gaps. As researchers, we need this in order for our research activities to be more relevant. Relevant to the smallholders who will most likely end the end users of the research activities we do. So before I end, I wish to thank Sirka and Dr. Bondo for giving me the opportunity to be part of this milestone. Thank you all for listening. Thank you very much, Dr. Pilato. Can I solicit a response or comments from... No? Not later? Okay. So now let's proceed to the open forum. So again, we have uh, mics. Okay. <laughs> Dr. Capatan is uh, ready for... Uh, uh, ready with a question. Yeah. Uh... I would like to talk, uh, I would like to thank Pala Dr. Bogdok to say uh, this is a very informative talk and this will actually rekindle again uh, you know, the enthusiasm, interest of uh, people towards the use, maybe a practice and research proposal making towards to address to organic, organic agriculture, organic farming, you know, and uh, yeah. I remember a lot of uh, yeah, stories about this, especially with animal science, where the interest for organic farming has long been there for such a long time. No? Even I remember Dr. Virginia Silverio, when she was asked, what about organic farming? She said, uh, when you use your organs, that's organic farming. You remember that? <laughs> but, uh, yeah. Well, a serious side, um, yeah. I would like to uh, thank Dr. Bodak again for uh, making artificial insemination an exception those uh, uh, technologies in the use of garden farm because I may lose my job. <laughs> yeah, but then again, on the same note, I would like to, uh, oh, that's a compromise actually, and I would like to see more compromises because lately, oh, it's not lately, not very lately, uh, the university in general and the College of Agriculture in particular has developed a program on Bachelor of Science in Animal or agri biotechnology, biotechnology, and this actually, especially those uh, part of that part in animal science, you know, utilizes a lot of biotechnological procedures in reproduction, which uh, is on a high level, a level uh, uh, higher end than artificial insemination. So I would like to see more compromises on that because we have been already graduating students major on this field and using a lot of you know procedures uh, in animal biotechnology. Thank you very much. Any more questions? From the students? We actually have students from Isabella State University come here. 
just for this lecture. Mm -hmm. po? <laughs> Comments? <laughs> Go ahead. Actually, this is not a question, but I've seen a lot of uh, in the presentation. I've seen a lot of things that would tell the, the audience that the lifestyle industry can provide a lot of uh, manual. Maybe that can be for fertilizer, but uh, that can also be for uh, generating energy to buy a gas. Uh, that's only a comment. I think it's not a question. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Pinani. I believe that's uh, true. That that's very important. And it follows up part of the principles of uh, organic livestock farming. Actually, if he talks to uh, people from CSM, when you say uh, you're from animal science, that's the first thing that they think of you when you are. <laughs> so anybody who comes from animal science and then they give lectures and says, uh, oh, if you're a manual expert, or if you're a manual expert, if you're a manual expert, if you're a manual expert, of course, they don't have to be in animal science, uh, so diversity, I don't know. Yeah, but I try to make it with the common doctor, uh, uh, the real situation is this, uh, a matter of compromises. Uh, in fact, if you, if you obviously my presentation, even the, uh, the number of uh, animals being used in organic farming represent only a very, very small number in the of Europe, although the demand there is very high. So I don't see you know, in the near future really coming up those compromises meaning to overtake the, uh, the demand for those conventional uh, uh, animal products from conventional uh, farming systems. In fact, as I was telling you, if you review yung uh, tinuturo natin sa animal production, madami doon is ano, madami doon sa active organic livestock farming principles. Ang problema lang, hindi natin sinusunod. Just like yung mga good animal, agricultural practices, GAPs, many of those are actually, hindi naman nag-contradictory, pareho-pareho lang din yun. What I, would, what I would like to propose is, just like, here for example, in in, uh, in Uvalde, if we are willing to, to reinvigorate our farms, I would like to come up maybe an alternative, an alternative, maybe for our students and maybe for practitioners, that there's this such thing as organic livestock farming. And as I was told in one of the meetings uh, in Germany, for sure, no, for sure, the organic livestock farming may not, may not uh, answer our problems in food security, maybe not in our lifetime. But I was told by an American uh, professor from you must from your Massachusetts said that, but if you think it's the right way to go, then by all means you have to embrace it and pursue it. And if you think, if you understand what organic farming is all about, and you think that's the right way to go, then by all means you do it. Ngayon siya sabi natin, pag alam ang tama, gawin mo. Ang problema, alam na natin yung mali, gawin pa rin natin. Diba? Sabi niya, pag ginawa mo yung tama, malayo ko na sa mali. Diba? Does it make sense? Kasi, nabimintahan na, hindi tama. Hindi mali mo gawin. Yes, I'll press it. I have another bag. Our population now is 101.6 million here. Yeah. And so as I look at the presentation, and I would like to congratulate my friend for making a very comprehensive and a very deep uh, search for all the things that we have to learn from organic livestock farming. So that's one comment that I would like to, uh, that, that impressed in my heart is that the demand for the requirement for feed for the Metro Manila area, because 67% of our population is living in Mega Manila, that is from Implex down to SCTEX, down to the SLEX. These are the Areas. And I gathered all the number of population, it's 67% of them. So if I look at organic livestock farming, I can see the application would be on SMILES, the Small Island Development Program, that may suit this program. And if you do that as a campaign banner, 
this coming election, you won't get elected because the majority of the people are living in Mega Manila. <laughs> so my point is, how do we strategize this matter? Do we promote this in the different islands for development? And then how do we process? Do we have to package them, process and sell them to the Mega Manila? Because uh, I'm very, it's, it's, that's, that's my, one of my concerns. And then the other one is, in here we are certifying the process, it's not the product, so there's no guarantee that this product that we offer to, to the people won't, will really provide health benefits. That is 100%. An impression only that it's better of the, the connection of them. Thank you. Uh, Thank you for the comment and question, uh, Dr. Neno. Um, yeah, ito yun, uh, as I said, uh, I'm trying to propose an alternative, alternative which, uh, for all we know, all people outside the Philippines know it already, uh, and, 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 and I'm quite optimistic. You know why? Because, kahit niya siya organic, ang literature tells us that as, as people grow richer, as economies grow richer, which we actually do, not the demand for animal products also increases. Nobody could refute that. Doon dami, kahit punta kayo sa sabi mula S6 pagbabang ganun, kasi sabi mo hirap, for sure, five, ten years ago, yung kanilang income mas malaki. And that would have an effect on the intake and demand for animal products. So, kaya ako optimistic eh, o kahit sa fraction lang doon sa isang demand, maggawa ng organic, Parang meron ka pa rin consciousness na oh, when, you, when you support organic types of farming, you have your share in uh, protecting the environment, you know, protecting, uh, promoting animal welfare. I think that would be more than enough. Nakatulong ka na rin na rin doon. Yung nga, kanina ko lang natin na technical. Although sa akin, realistically, you know, sa akin, uh, in response to KK, Dr. Jean Marina, uh, para rin tumagal to, lalo yung kanyang uh, value and more value. It's still up for us no, to find what is there in our native products. No? We have to find something what is there which would compete with the commercial uh, needs. Otherwise, if we just stick with those traditional mga traits like fatigueness, daily things, there's no way that our local breeds would outcompete or out outperform the commercial breeds. Lalo nung mga highlight kung gaano pa pangit yung ating mga but that's why I would like to enjoy the, the research community. You know, please join us. Now, please join us. Try to look for what's there in our native animals. Perhaps it might be in the nutrition, nutritional value. We don't know. But sabi nga, ang, ang organic farming is hindi siya low tech. Eh. We could make use of the advances in science in order to pursue our goals in trying to promote these native genetic resources. Uh, like for example, uh, we have had already some researches together with Dr. Landio promoting native chickens that the preference by, uh, by people, scientific or genetic test, is maybe uh, in favor of uh, native uh, chickens compared to the commercial uh, broilers that you have. And we've done that also in goats. Iba rin yung may halong native na goat or purong goat kumpara dun sa iba. So yung naman, kailangan lang tayo maghanap. Hindi pa pwede yung uh, we have, kailangan maging creative tayo. Uh, example, yung, yung, yung perception na uh, disease resistance. So, uh, perception yan. Perception pa yan eh. Tingnan mo sa literature, wala namang literature na sasabi na. Pag tinamahan yung mga manok mong, uh, kahit yung sasabukin, pag tinamahan yung sipon, pakilin yan. Wala namang kasi tayo perception kasi the native. Kaya nga, I would like to enjoy yung sa research community. Yeah, please, please help us. Uh, madami yun ha. Uh, yung related on, particularly sa uh, adaptation, mga adaptation at race. At sa akin, yung ano, uh, meron akong frequent sa madami, like yung uh, pagpunta ng lipidomis na, yung fat research, yung meat, milk and eggs, ang common denominator yun is fat. Pero hindi naman alam mo ng lahat, na hindi lahat ng fats ay pangit. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> hindi, hindi lahat ng fats, fats ay hindi fat. Hindi lahat ng fat ay matap, ay, ay uh, masama. Pero hindi, kailangan. And usually, this could actually be manipulated or could be found in native genetic resources. Yun ang nakikita. Meron mga, yung mga nutritional values na makikita mo lang doon sa mga organic uh, farming system. Just like what happens sa milk. 
just like last year, after this part of publication showing that based on a very big data set, that milk coming from organically produced farms has really a lot of uh, advantages nutritionally compared to that coming from commercial uh, concentrate fed na mga, na mga cows. And because of that, the bagong, the bagong market na yun, ano, sa, sa US, pumunta ka supermarket, iba rin. Ah, they're going for organic. Mababago rin yung, yung mga building programs. Kasi may iba yung mga traits. Pero yun, kagaya ng example nila, kailangan maghanap tayo kung anong meron. Kung anong meron tayo. Hindi yung pwedeng sabihin, ah, no, well, yeah. Parang sa basketball ba, kahit sa TV, pag ikaw yung hindi ka feel arm, no? kaya in court, wala, may minasweldo mo. Pag ikaw yung native, no? local ka lang, may minasweldo mo. Pero dapat baguhin natin yun. Local is good. Native is good. Pero ano yung good? Kailangan hanapin natin, technically, scientifically. Yeah. I am very tired. I thank you very much for the nice presentation. Quite interesting. But I will be relating to you, market. Okay? Katulad ng sinabi ni Dr. Vega, Metro Manila will have a different perspective of trying to seek for organic chicken. But what I would like to tell you is my experience during the past two two months. Uh, I, I visited Marito Gay in the Midoro. In places where you do not have electricity, then you do not have frozen chicken. Okay, I'm just second frozen chicken. So that is why uh, yung sinasad yung maybe we will promote it in island provinces. I think that is true because in island provinces, kung wala electricity, wala frozen chicken. So if you go to the market, it is present alive the chicken in the market, and you will have to buy it from there. Okay, in those instances, ah, uh, buhay ang small farm uh, like, uh, livestock. Buhay doon, lalo na sa mga smaller islands where they, they do not have source of uh, transport from Manila or frozen chicken or beef or other things. Then uh, the local market should be sustained. Actually, wala na namang presentation doon sa where are these small uh, stockholders aside from the organic uh, stockholders. And, and, and I, I think there is a lot that is being uh, done. Oh, it is still going na merong uh, local uh, livestock in small places where you do not have electricity. And I think uh, you have to revisit that. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for the comment. And then, you know, at least it's, it's a matter of changing your mindset. Like, like, for example, uh, yung pagkain ng animal product, uh, lalo kung mga hira, alam nyo bang hindi naman ganun kadami talaga yung kumakain ng mga choice cuts? Anong pinakain ng karamihan? Anong mga hira? Laman loob. Di ba? Laman loob. Pero kagaya nung lumabas sa researches, doon nila Dr. Vega, dahil sa pagka na nakita na madami mga residues na nakukuha sa sa mga, or, mga hindi organic na mga production system na hindi natutunaw. Sa brain sila nagsiasete, eh. hindi naman doon sa karne, hindi naman doon sa ito, hindi naman sa gatas eh. Nandun sa laman loob eh. At ay, yung mga bituka, nandun lahat yun. Kaya kung mag mag-inform ang mga tao na ano, okay, hindi problema yung ano, okay lang kumain ng laman loob. Pero okay, kaya baka tayo ng hindi organic na reproduce. Kasi pag organic na reproduce ka, at least medyo safe ka na, ay wala masyadong residues yan. Diba? So, sa akin, sa matter of mindset, inform people na kung ano yung mga options, yung, yung options. Kasi pag walang options, wala, may hirap. And I think that's one of the obligations ng mga academia. We, we provide them with options, we provide them information. But they can come up with correct decisions pa. Kasi ako, ano uh, ko eh, I'm optimistic. Basta yung mayaman ng tao, yung mayaman ng pamilya, yung mayaman ng bansa. Siguro naman, ganun lang tayo lahat. Kasi kapag sabi nila, pag tumataba ka daw sa inyo na ano eh, Ibig sabihin, mas malaki ang tumatas ang intake ng ano, ang intake ng, uh, ng uh, animal uh, animal products. Kaya sa akin, sige ko, mindset lang yan. Kailangan, uh, you don't have to back this up with scientific evidence. Kasi ang nangyayari, karamihan, nung may started, uh, I was involved in sa, sa organic farming dito, uh, like sa farming. Yeah. Ang nangyayari yan, kasi nga, because of the premium price being given to organically produced like sa products, people are going into parang sa bahagwagon, no? but not 
uh, nothing else except ang tanong na yan, parang market employee. Pero kung titignan mo, walang science. Walang science yung ginagawa nila. Kaya ang sabi ko, I'm joining the people na, lalo yung sa akatin, na ipakita ko na yung scientific background. Bakit natin pinapromote yung, yung organic? At hindi naman siya ganang talaga kaiba na naisip ng madami tao na pag sa'yo organic, low-tech, oh, naikip lang yan, low-tech. In fact, malikta, pumunta ka sa euro. Pag sa'yo organic, high-tech yan, pinag-uusapan. No, kahit gabi nila ang mga researchers sa developing countries, pwede mo mag-analyze na lahat. So, I'm thinking mindset. Yes, sir. Yeah, okay. Uh, I'd like to talk a little bit. I hope you can clarify on fighting cancer. See, when we did a roadmap for the livestock and feeds industry two years ago, it was very surprising na kung tangin mo yung mga dealers ng agri-supplies, up to 40% of their income is provided by the fighting cut business mga inputs na ng sako. Now that we are doing with Sierka a native chicken uh, project to be fed with cow bee no, as an organic feed ingredient, medyo mahirap din i-relate to sa small carrot holder farmers namin sa Batak at saka sa Tabirian at Samis Oriental na some of these farmers we are dealing with also raise uh, like a cow. So, kontradita kasi ito sa organic dahil na natin lahat yung pan, uh, inputs, beans, feed ingredients, na pagtorok, mahog, etc. And yet, uh, you cannot deny that it's, it's such a huge industry. Na, nandyan, pati yung mga mayayaman na hindi mo naman basta-basta mga palyo lang, including the, the, the animal health uh, people. Our perplex bed is that uh, it cannot just be simply violation of animal welfare. Sabi ng the team uh, about three years ago, sabi niya, hindi naman lang ours uh, bawal yung pagsakong kundi, bawal ang cruelty, ang sabi niya sa akin. So, okay. Uh, or wait, saan ba nang galing talaga yung Texas na breed? <laughs> saan ba ngayon? Ang gayon, ang gayon, hindi smuggle pa ng mga Pinoy through the eggs. Dahil yun pa rin ang tracks ng fighting cup industry. Pangalawa, uh, kung mag-research tayo, siguro naman, I think little by little, uh, mag-thread din tayo dito sa bawal na area na ito. Siguro i-reduce naman natin yung, uh, yung pan elements to sa fighting cup business through science. Kung science din naman ang may, 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 relay, may uh, basis naman yung pag-thread nila ng fighting instinct ng harap. And when Mitra was still alive, the late uh, Secretary of Agriculture was still alive. You remember that he used the Parawakan chicken as one of the foundation of his uh, breeds yes. for fighting cats. So, it's a close relationship ng native at saka fighting cats. When I was growing up, I was able to train the chicken for the train of the chicken for the train of the chicken for the train of the train of the train of the train pag panalo siya ng panalo siya ng pagtatari, meron pa kami yung tip. So mga gano'n, uh, uh, saan ba nagmula yun? At saka, is it uh, within the horizon na mayroon ba tayong magawang research on the fighting cup business? Para sa gano'n, when we grow uh, organic feeds for our native chickens na nag-aalaga rin pala ng, ng pansabong yung, uh, yung asawa, yung, maski babae yung nag-aaskaso na mga native chickens. And hindi natin may dissociate yung may, paano natin ma-certify yan at natin yung mga fighting camps. Yun ang aking, yun ang aking problema. Sige nga, Robin. Ganti sa fighting camps are chickens. Uh, actually, yung nilagay kong uh, yung, yung statistics about yung pumilay sa small holder for chickens, uh, it's uh, down to 45% na yung small holder going down. Sa so, tingin mo nga, baka mali ba yun eh? Kasi sa tingin mo, natin ng 45%, a big part of that is actually the power business. Madami doon. Makikita nyo naman sa TV eh, di ba? Kasi kung palang tayo magawa ng direct para ng mga TV station, TV programs, advertisement, kung siyempre kung hindi yung mga meron kaya na. And I, right, for one, I've already experienced that sa mga working with the, those in the, in the industry then. But on the breeding side lang, technical, 
this idea is qualified. Napaka sabi na pero mo ang gamli na ba? Hindi ako. Pero I I I did go around then na pizza pizza din pa o farms din dito. So totoo po yon na although yung fighting cats actually is although malaking kasi dito sa dos may ni pa yung Spaniards lang ba sa Chronicle pa yung pig pigat ay tamang kaming pagjela. Pero yung fighting cat business is actually as old as sa kapitres as mga sa Chinese. Tak ada yang Chinese, tak ada yang aku di mana Japanese, kerana masa di bawah tidak ada daya, mana tahu, na ini kos naga luar luar naya. Tapi muntah ke sa Amerika, kerana dia nak makan najis dia di mana sa South, ah berlari dia, untuk band dari naya, untuk mina kata susu pernah dengan Spanyol Taiwan, ah makan nanti sa South, spesifikasi mungkin kita banyak sa Pasifik, sa Oceania, Texas itu le. Kaya most likely yung sinasabi ng Texas kasi nung ako yung mag-iipa doon ang alam ko lang Texas yung bubble gum eh Bubble gum, bubble gum, di ba? May masing ko kung naalala niya Texas rin ang tama Pero ganun rin, gano'n kasi malamang sa Texas Pero ngayon ang business doon kasi magkakaiba yung mga laga ng mga fighting cats eh Like dito sa atin, magamit ng tari Pero kung pumunta ka sa North America, ako rin madami ng mga sabong sa Mexico Doon ba daw kami? Kasi na-arrest ka ng mga Spaniards eh. Pero pag titignan mo doon, ito naman ang laban na doon. Bububa ng laban doon. Vlogs na ang patagala sa atin. Spesya ka na patay. Pero yung yung management, mabot na yung sasaktula na ako yung genetics na halos pare-pareho na yun sila. Pare-pareho. Kaya ang secret na lang ng labanan dyan is training at nutrition. Kaya ang totoo yung nasabi niya rin sir na ano, na madami rin na yung tinuturo ko rin doon. Kasi nung araw rin, kung ako yung maliit ng test, masama sa mga kaibigan ko, hindi ko na gusto ha. Meron ka talaga sambutan. Kaya ko alam nyo yun. Pag natalo mo yung kalaban mo, sambut mo yung maletra niya. Pulutan na yun. Pero ngayon, wala na gusto na sambutan. Kasi pag kasambut mo yung kalaban, pagdan ng mga antibiotic na at mga residue, kahit na hindi mo na makuha yun sa pakulula o sa plito, na kasama mo na yung kalain eh. Pero, on the other hand, ayaw po, ayaw pa po sa to, so some other mga mga fishats na naman ng game for business. Totoo yun, meron nandun. Kaya lang, alam nyo ba meron din growing na sentiment test? Ayun, mindset lang yan eh. Naku, ano yung kasing ginagawa sa tao? Yan yung ginagawa sa game for business. So, kung bumasa ko yung organic farming, alam nyo, gusto na rin lang lagyan sa kanilang diet ng mga natural, natural products. Kaya sabi ko, I will not be surprised pag nakalagay nyo nyo sa mga TV, mga organically produced feed in regions, mga phyto, mga panggamot ng mga plant-based na mga panggamot sa mga mga fighting cats following the, the rules of uh, of uh, organic uh, farming except na lang yung cruelty sa welfare. Pwede sa nutrition side, ito problem, we don't know for sure sa nutrition, madami, madami, mga, madami kayang options. And I will not be surprised na uh, hindi nyo araw at dumating yan, sir, tawa, eksa nyo ako. Let's have one last question from uh, one and one last. <laughs> uh, thank you very much for inviting us. We're from Southern State University, and uh, I am Jonathan Nega. Working in the actually, thank you very much for examining the artificial insemination for for livestock because. We're doing artificial insemination for goats. Uh, this is uh, under the Picard DOSD project. And uh, we're doing a lot of testing of the artificial insemination throughout the country. And, uh, and uh, the purpose of uh, doing this artificial insemination is to produce quality goat for, for slaughter animals. And uh, we are basically doing a lot of, uh, a lot of works in uh, meat products or shepherd products. We're doing kinds for the vacuum packs and uh, other products in, in goats. And that is through the initiative of artificial insemination as we go along the way. Now, uh, I, I think I need to work with you in the future or to collaborate you in the future and I hope you will also, uh, you will also uh, consider us because our, our main target is to go on an upgrading program for our goats and uh, in, uh, in doing such, we don't want also to probably to sacrifice the organic uh, organic system no? that, that you have mentioned well ago. So probably that 
that I hope that our, our, our undertaking is along the line with the breeding program or the breeding objectives and to produce quality, probably quality goals or quality organic goals in, in the future. So, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hang. Thank you also for coming. Totoo yun, uh, so ngayon, exempted ng AI. No? In fact, I would foresee na malamang natural boots, box, boards, or rubs rin ang gamitin. Why? Maybe because mababa pa rin ang usage rate at success rate ng AI. Kaya hindi ka uubrad pa rin, ng, hindi pwedeng wala pa rin yung mga ating mga ating tapos. Kaya, pero ako, I, I would like to see them in the future na sana pagdulutuhan rin, na-improve pa rin yung pag-success rate at usage rate ng AI. Okay. Because last year, most of the people who are in the city, most of the people who are in the city, most of the people who are in the city, most of the people who are in the city, most of the people who are in Pero ito sa ngayon po ay uh, hindi ko naman po ikokomersal ang forest food farm kung hindi. Ako po ay uh, gusto ko lang i-share kay Doktor. Nung nakaraan kayo po ay nag-visit sa amin at nakita po ninyo yung aming pong mga baboy na maliliit. Na sabi po, yung pong mga baboy na yun, mahirap nang mabenta kasi maliliit po siya mga miniature pigs. So, dun po sa mga pinag-present po ninyo dito, nakita ko po yung mga rules about lalo na po tingin sa mga organic farming. Sa ngayon po, ang aking aking uh, farm ay nagpapractice po ako sa IDOPS or Integrated Diversified Organic Farming System. Ako po ay uh, uh, nag-undergan na po ng mga seminars from the Agricultural Technical Institute okay, or the ATI. And then after that po, nung nakita ko po na medyo mahirap ang market ng organic farming dahil napakadami nga pong batas na sinusunod. So, umisip po ako na something na po pwede pagkakitaan doon sa mga maliliit na baboy o yung mga miniature pigs. So, ginawa ko po dito, kagaya nga po ninyo sabi po ninyo sa amin, lalagyan natin ng uh, science. Okay po? Yung dumating po ngayon ng ATI sa amin, tinuro po kami gumawa about the fish amino acid, paggawa po ng mga fish, uh, fermented fruit juice, fermented plant juice na nakatutulong sa pagla paglaki ng mga baboy na ito and even the mga probiotics. So with that po, yung pong maliliit na big sa amin, sa ngayon ay hindi ko po naging problema na ang pagmamarket dahil ako po ay tinulungan ng Department of Tourism na ma-accredit po at kami po ay naka-invento ng isang uri ng pagkain na kung saan nagmumula din po doon sa farm. Ang farm ko po ay sa uh, talaga pong uh, idol sa natin pong ginagawa doon. At uh, through that, naalala ko nga po kanina habang kayo nag-explain, hindi po magiging problema o hindi problema lalo tigit sa aming maliliit na stakeholders or farmer na ang pagmamarket nito even without na wala pa kayo doon tinatawag nating uh, uh, certification. Ang GAPS ay nanibiyan din ang po pwedeng makatulong. At uh, ang isa po sa aking ginawa dito ay Umisip po kami ng pagkain. Doc, yun yung isa sa natin. Parang yun ang nandodod kayo. With which the, the pansit kalabuho. Na ang content po nito ay yung baboy na walang pakialam. Yung hindi, hindi namin pinapakialaman po. Anong mangyari sa kanya. Basta siya, magbabahan to, dumami to, at pagkatapos, okay, kung tumabalo magigumanda, nakita na dumating, katayin natin. Dahil ang lilit lang ng size niya, almost, uh, pagka, po pwede mo nang katayin siya sa edad pa lang ng mga limang buwan, tumitibang na siya ng mga apat o limang kilo. Ang isang gusto kumain ng baboy, kung isang gusto niya part, eh head, ikaw ba naman magkakarika ng napakalaking baboy? So, doon po nakita ko, may market yung maliliit na baboy na yun. Wala mong pinagkaiba sa, sa malalaking papaya na noon, palaking yan ng papaya, pero sa mayon palitan ng papaya. So, with that, nakita ko po na ang organic farming na tinuturo sa ngayon ay noong pa man ay pinapractice na lang sa na, 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 natalo siya ng mga conventional na sa kayong bumabalik itong convention pabalik dito ngayon sa uh, lumang pamamaraan na, na inilalagay sa bagong teknolohiya 
na kung tutusin, kung makikita talaga natin, kung siya sa siya sa sinasabi ni Doktor, dog yung siya siya na yun, matagal na ginagawa, ginagawa sa farm, ah, hindi lang nare-recognize, hindi lang binibigyan talaga ng pansin. So, nang makita ko po at nakita, nakita namin sa farm na may bukas talaga ang organic farming. Kaya po, tinuloy-tuloy po namin sa so, dog, yun po ang isa sa aming ginawa. At yung pong aming uh, ginawang uri ng pagkain na yun, ito po yung nakita ng media with Sandy Daza. At yung po dog na kinain ninyo, ngayon po is food link for Asia. At sa ganun parang po, nakita po namin na talaga pala na ang organiko, wala kang talo. Kaya kang natalo, wala kang ginawa. Dog, salamat po. Uh, first, uh, Joel, thank you. Siyempre nakilala kita. In fact, yung pictures na pinakita pa rin na galing sa farm ni Joel, Joel. Uh, kasama ko sila, Dr. Vega, ang mga kapit ng sila, 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 sila rin eh. Yun ang sinasabi ko. Uh, Una-una is uh, information kailangan. And uh, we expect, sabi ka kanina, yung traditional knowledge, na may mas madami pang alami na sa loob ka. Kasi yung tinutunong natin dito. Kailangan natin na natin. Yung nga na, yung sinasabi yung labi natin ng science, after all, yung sabi na nun, yung organized lang tayo, to be creating, try things out. Kasi sila naman talaga yung ano eh, sila yung end user. Kailangan malaman natin yun. Kasi kahit anong galing mo sa genetics, sa statistics, sa computer, kung wala ka namang, wala namang sa isa yung tinalagay mo, sabi ka nila, garbage is garbage. Ha? Wala rin. Kaya dapat siya to touch base. Tapos talagang magamit. At makipagkita. Sabi ko, mas madami silang uh, alam. And that would be a lot. That's a good uh, point. Ah, uh, ganun, ganun pa man sabi, ganun pa rin yung panawagan ko. Tulungan natin, maghanap, creative. Ano yung meron na tagad sa ating mga native, no? Product pa yun, o process, na parang ipaklaban natin dun sa mga conventional na mga breeds na ganun na natin din natin makakalaban. Pag ang parameters ay yung mga traditional na nakapis na ng atin, hindi talagang tayo mananalo. Pero yun ako, congratulations sa uh, Joel. Maraming sila. The original breeds actually that were brought here are Halsey, Oasis, uh, some others, no? Hindi yung Texas. Thank you very much. Ano yan, actually, yung mga puso ngayon hindi yung Texas. Pag nga makita mo yung mga lines niya, yung mga balata. Pero pag analyze nyo, yung mga pangalan na yun, yung pangalan nyo ng mga may-ari, yung mga matang pananang lato. Halsey is a name. Hatch is a name. Karamihan niya.
plantations so that they will eat the grass. And we do not spend any more for uh, tractor, using the tractor for uh, labor, uh, expensive labor for cutting the grass. But uh, when I said goat, oh, we found the goat, we eat the, the bark of the, of the trees. So we gave up the goat and only use cattle. And then I observed that in the, 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 the uh, pioneers, the homesteaders there in the forest, with little lots, they use naked chicken because the naked chicken will eat the insects and prevent it's the infestation of insects in their crops. So I, I suggest to you, when you become a homesteader <laughs> there in the fall in the highland or a planter, tree planter there in the forest, use cattle and use native chicken because you will have masarap na pagkain. You can have birthday every day. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Uh, actually, isa po yun sa mga gold points sa organic and livestock farming so that you pointed out, uh, doon po sa karesyo of agriculture that will fall down in agroforestry ng mga system. So, yung mga tagaang system at alam po rin yun. Pero actually, merong overlaps rin yan eh. Uh, ikaw, maglalagay mo yung mga livestock sa forestry na. No? Mas maganda-ganda nga yun kasi medyo malayo sila dun sa conventional ng mga production systems. Although may isang nag-joke lang din sa isang kasama ko, pag pag Malaysia rin, nagpapumpaya rin kami na kung ano yung isang agroforestry. Mahirap rin sa isang banda yung lagay kasi in the first place, wala na yung forestry. Diba? Uh, buti sana, madami tayong forestry. Pero kung wala ka ng forestry, wala ka na magkagawa dyan siya. Pero yeah, you're, you're right sir. Tama yung isang road point na lang applications ng organic livestock farming, especially for our ruminants and goats. And although, I have to correct you for that yung sa goats. Alam nyo, ang goats yung isa sa pinakamatalino ang ano yan eh. Isa sa pinakamatalino at pinakamasela at mapiling mga hayo. Opo, yun nga lang siguro na natatay na sila na kahit ano lang pinakain, kahit yung sinambay mo. So, siguro, wala na kasi makain. Pero given the choice, sa tingin ko, and I let them work with the goats then. So yes, it's the pinakamatalino. Kagaya ng event of Prate, before we have this isolated, in-isolated namin yung mga native black, mga native brown na goats, na dinadayan dito. Tumatawain sila kasi, pag yung mga bus, tsaka jeep goats na mga sadyate, pag dumating yan, isang tawag lang nung ano, tawag lang nung caretaker, bibili niya sila, gawin niya. Kaya nang interview ako ni Anglo Palmares na Saracho eh. Sabi niya, uy! Pinaan na lang na pinakamagaling pala na natatalino pala yung mga goals. Sabi ko nun, sabi ko na makakapos, natalino na ba yung sa bago eh. Pero kinukulit ako, sabi, hindi, bakit talaga matalino yung goals? Sabi ko, siyempre naman, tagayuti rin yung mga yan. Kaya yun, ano na siya, uy, punta kayo sa Spanos. Pati yung mga kambi, matatalino. So, pero po, matalino ang kambi.